Hey everybody, this is Emily with Snake Discovery, and a while ago we did a video about our top five recommended snake species for beginner owners. And due to popular demand, today we're going to be introducing to you our top five picks for intermediate snakes. This isn't to say that these top five snakes in today's list aren't snakes you can have as a beginner keeper. They're merely just species that require a little bit more research and preparation in order to take care of properly. As you can probably guess, our first pick for the top five intermediate snakes is the Western, or now known as the Plains hognose snake. Plains hognose snakes were close to making it to our top five beginners list, but they didn't for a couple of reasons. I mean, they are adorable snakes, and they're generally pretty docile and easy to handle, and they also stay a relatively small size. Females only get to about three feet as adults, and males stick closer to about two feet. So males and females can comfortably live in a 20-gallon tank or equivalent-sized bin as adults. Additionally, Plains hognose snakes are pretty available, and actually increasingly available, as more breeders are producing them. Another pro to Plains hognose snakes is that there virtually aren't any taken from the wild, and they are pretty much all bred in captivity nowadays, which means they are hardier than wild-caught specimens. Because of this, their price is in the middle of the road. For a normal hognose snake, you can expect to pay around $80 to $100, but if you were to ask us five years ago, they were probably only $40 or $50. But with the rise in popularity of hognose snakes, their prices have increased slightly, but they're still not terrible. There are also many morphs available, too. You can find color morphs like albinos pretty easily, and you can find anaconda or condophase hognose snakes, which is a pattern morph, and both of those are pretty basic morphs that are fairly readily available or easy to find. But if you want something a little bit fancier, you can also get something like a lavender morph or a sable. Another pro to Plains hognose snakes is that rodents make a complete diet for them, as long as they're willing to eat rodents. Which brings me to the cons of hognose snakes. In the wild, plains hognose snakes eat primarily toads and other amphibians, so in captivity they are inclined to refuse to eat rodents altogether because they, something in their mind is telling them that they just want to eat toads. There are plenty of ways around this, it just takes a lot of patience and some creativity at times, but you can often get plains hognose snakes to eat rodents eventually. That was the main reason why we kept hognose snakes off of our beginners list, is because they are notoriously picky eaters. And if people get these as their first snake, usually the first snake you get you want to baby. You want to hold it a lot, you want to keep a close eye on it, you want it to eat, and if they refuse food, some people are inclined to try to feed them every day until they eat. But hognoses are also a little bit high strung, so the more you baby them if they don't want to eat, the less likely they are to eat in the future. We have sold some of our baby plains hognose snakes to first-time snake owners, and they're well aware that they can be picky eaters, but it still seems like almost every time they get worried because they're not eating, and then they, it's stressful for the new snake owner, and then it's tough for us because we're trying to troubleshoot to figure out why they're not eating. Usually it's because they're just being handled too much or they have too big of an enclosure, but it's really just easy to leave a hognose snake to be your second snake and not your first. The only other con to plains hognose snakes is that they are technically mildly venomous. They have enlarged rear teeth. They're not actually fangs, they just have a groove along the side of the tooth, and they have to chew in their toxic saliva into their prey items. Although this specialized saliva will paralyze its prey, or toads in the wild, it causes very little reactions to humans. Basically just causes like a bee sting type reaction, so swelling and itchiness and maybe some pain, localized pain. But just like a bee sting, everybody reacts differently differently, so I mean it's good to know that they are technically mildly venomous. The next snake on the list is the African egg-eating snake, or Daisy Peltis genus. These guys are so cool, and they have some amazing adaptations. I mean, for beginners, their defense mechanism is to rub their scales together to mimic the saw-scaled viper, and they have no teeth because they only eat eggs, so they literally can't bite you. Also, being from a dry, arid climate, they don't have very high humidity requirements, so I don't even give them a humidity box when they're in shed. I have in the past, but they never use it, and they always have complete sheds, so I really think that they just don't have any use for for high humidity at any point during their life. They also stay a manageable size. This is a full adult 
female, they get around, as you can see, three feet or so. Males stay considerably smaller at only around 18 inches to two feet max. As you can imagine, they only eat eggs. Full whole eggs are a complete diet for the egg, or the African egg-eating snake, and no mice are involved whatsoever, which is why a lot of people fancy this species or this genus. Feeding them is just a matter of scattering appropriately sized eggs in their enclosure, and then you just remove the egg shells afterwards, because the way they eat is they swallow the egg whole, they push it to the back of their throat where they have specialized projections right here, bony projections that crack the egg, and then they use those muscles to squeeze out all of the juices, the, the yolk from the egg, they drink all of that, and finally they spit up the crushed shell afterwards. You can see on her where that muscle is, where it's a bit thicker there behind her head, that's where the egg goes to get crushed down. However, the fact that they only eat eggs is actually kind of their downfall and the reason why we don't recommend them as beginner pets. Adults, first off, are primarily wild-caught animals, and there's a plethora of problems that you come across when getting a wild-caught animal, including parasites and just general health issues. Adults like this girl here, this is a Daisy Peltiscanzi, by the way. Her name is Traveler. She was given to us by a fan. Adults like this are big enough to eat eggs from Caternix quail, and she can even handle chicken eggs, too. I try to pick out smaller chicken eggs, but she handles them like a champ. Males, on the other hand, which stay significantly smaller, sometimes get big enough to eat Caternix quail eggs, which you can just find at local Asian supermarkets, but usually they only get big enough to handle button quail eggs, which are a lot harder to find, but you can usually find them on eBay. If you search hard enough, you can find captive bred African egg-eating snakes, which is by far the way to go when you are acquiring one of these, if you do. However, babies are first off hard to find. There's not many breeders of these snakes in the United States alone, but if you're able to find one, they are only big enough to eat finch eggs. You can't buy finch eggs anywhere. There's maybe like one seller online, but like they're very, very difficult to come across in large quantities because a baby will need about one of these every week. You can sometimes, if you have a good relationship with your local pet store, get finch eggs from their finches that are for sale. Or if you have a local bird fair or bird expo in, their, in your area, you can sometimes ask vendors if they have leftover eggs. But usually people with finches who have eggs want to hatch those eggs and raise them into to birds, so they don't want to give them up. So finding finch eggs is extremely difficult unless you know the right people. Some people are under the impression that you can crack an egg and put it in a bowl, but they don't drink it up like some people expect them to because that's just not their natural behavior. They don't drink that in the wild. They swallow whole eggs. And another method that some people wish to try is tube feeding a baby egg-eating snake because they can't find finch eggs, but that is very risky and it can kill the snake easily if you do it the wrong way. So neither of those options are really good if you want to keep an egg-eating snake. You really truly do need to find a source of eggs that are the appropriate size for the egg eater. And if you do, if you can find a good source, then they're actually pretty easy to keep otherwise. The only other drawback to African egg-eating snakes is in the wild they don't eat year-round because birds don't nest year-round. So it's normal for them to go off food for upwards of six months or so. So in captivity they often go through long periods of time where they refuse to eat any eggs whatsoever and they may even lose a little bit of weight but that is completely normal. But that can of course stress out a reptile keeper quite a bit. The third snake on our list is the Woma Python. These are awesome. They stay a, like a perfect size as adults. They get about five feet long, which is totally manageable, yet still big enough to have like a, you know, a decent sized snake as a pet. As an adult, they can live comfortably in like a 75 gallon tank or a similar sized bin. They don't have any special humidity requirements and they are very hardy too. They are a little bit harder to find, but I think they are the most readily available snake species from Australia that we have in the United States. But because they are still a rather uncommon snake kept in the United States, they can be kind of expensive. You can expect to pay around $250 to $300 in the States. I know that in Australia they are much cheaper from what I understand, just because there's a lot more of them available in Australia, but that just goes to show that it depends on where you live that'll influence how much a snake is, of course. But in the States, around 
250 to $300 is what you can expect. Since Australia does not allow the exportation of any of their native animals, all of the Woma pythons in the United States are captive bred by law. The initial ones that were brought into the States were all on the black market because they were taken illegally from Australia, but since they could never trace who first did it and they started breeding in the United States, they kind of just gave up on that chase and now we can own them. Another great thing about Woma pythons is that they are pretty docile and they are fantastic eaters. They have great feeding responses. But because of that, they sometimes get a little overexcited for food and so they can be a little bit toothy, I guess, when it comes to feeding time. So you really just have to watch their behavior until they realize that if you want to handle them, it's not feeding time, it's handling time because they may treat you with an initial feeding response when you try to take them out. Sometimes this gives them a bad rap and people say that they are a nippy species of snake, but as long as you socialize them from a young age, as you can see, they can be very docile and very handleable as adults. I bring this girl with me to programs quite frequently and I let kids hold her, she has never bit, she is amazing. Whereas our male here, we don't handle much at all. I don't bring him to programs. And as you can see, he moves around a little bit more than the female here does, who is used to, used to socialization. But he's still not bitey. He is, that might be, no, that wasn't a strike pose. He's just sitting, he's calming down a little bit. But as you can see, they're not as bad as people think they are. They can come in various shades with their striping. Our male has these beautiful dark colorations or striations in his scales, and the female is quite a bit lighter overall, but they're both beautiful animals. Woma pythons are just gorgeous. And fun little thing that I've noticed with having Woma pythons is that they, they have a slight odor to them. Not a bad odor, they just have a unique smell to them. I've never noticed it in any other species that we keep, but it's, I can't even describe it. It's just, they have an interesting odor. They also have orange bellies. Look at that, isn't that cool? So overall, Woma pythons are amazing snakes. We put them in the intermediate list though because they can be a little bit food aggressive, but you can work them out of that of course. And they're a little bit harder to find and therefore they're a little more expensive. Coming in at number four on our list is the boa constrictor. This is Doug, our common boa constrictor or BCI. And for the sake of this video, we're going to be referring to BCIs and BCCs or boa constrictor imperator or boa constrictor constrictors. Those two species are very closely related, which is why we're gonna to refer to both of them in this video. In case you don't already know, the BCI is the uh, common boa constrictor like Doug here and BCCs are the true red tail boas. Bo Boa constrictors like Doug here are amazing, just gentle giants. They are big animals. They aren't your 20 foot python though. They stay at around seven to eight feet and they are pretty docile animals too. Almost all captive bred boa constrictors are pretty docile. Not saying all of them are, but the majority of them are handleable. Even the ones that people say aren't very friendly are often just misunderstood. You just have to read their body language properly and handle them properly. We were once called to someone's house to rescue an aggressive boa constrictor. And when we arrived, it was locked up in its cage and I guess hadn't been held in quite a while. And we reached right on in and picked it up and it was just as friendly as Doug was and they were so surprised and they thought for sure we were gonna get bit. So really you just have to watch their body language and handle them properly and they'll be friendly back to you. They are also amazing eaters. Boa constrictors love to eat food. Because of that, they are prone to becoming overweight so you do have to watch what they eat. But feeding them is pretty easy too. Just appropriately sized rodents. Doug eats one rabbit or guinea pig or really big rat once every three to four weeks and that's it. They're very slow moving animals and I think they're kind of dumb, but I think that's what makes them so friendly, honestly. They come in a huge variety of morphs too. You can get just plain old albino boas. You can get sun glows, which are beautiful. I personally just really like the wild type though. Another pro to common boas and red tail boas is that they are pretty easy to find. They're pretty readily available. Red tails, true red tails, are a little bit harder to find than the common boas like this one. But because of how many there are out there in the market, they aren't terribly priced. They're pretty cheap. I got him for free. There's usually rescues or herpetological societies that are overrun with boa constrictors needing homes, and therefore there's barely any adoption fee for them because they need to find them new homes. I think the reason why they are 
are found in rescues though is because of their large adult size. Because they get so big, they do need a lot of room and a large habitat that they can fully outstretch in, preferably along one long wall, but you can also give them an enclosure that allows them to outstretch along two adjacent walls. They are semi-arboreal or tree dwelling. They spend a lot of time on the forest floor, but they will climb around on branches too. So if you give them a large enclosure that's not only wide, but also tall, they will utilize that vertical space and they make a really good show animal or display animal too. The only other downside I can think of with boa constrictors, other than their big size and therefore they need a lot of space and therefore extra money to um, properly house them, of course, is that they are nocturnal. So like ball pythons, they can be kind of like pet rocks where they're very sedentary. They don't actively pursue their prey like many diurnal species do. Instead, they just kind of sit and wait for the food to come to them. So they might not be as entertaining of a pet snake as say a garter snake would be. That's not to say that they never move though. We have noticed that when Doug is hungry, he becomes much more active, especially at night since they're nocturnal. So you will see them moving around from time to time, especially when they're ready for a meal. You know, I bet they are considered aggressive sometimes just because their strike speed when it comes to eating their prey is so fast, it kind of startles you. They're just very fast moving animals only when it comes to eating though. So overall, boa constrictors are really good animals. We just have them on the intermediate list instead of beginner's list because of how big they get and therefore how big of an enclosure you need to A, have room for and B, afford. Our fifth and final snake on the intermediate snakes list would be the Burmese python. I have found a recent passion for Burmese pythons in the last couple of years or so, probably because of our rescue Popeye. And uh, these are two newish babies that we have that we're gonna raise up. This is, I think I'm gonna call her Sunkist. I don't know. There were a lot of great suggestions when we uh, first introduced her. She's just an albino Burmese python. And this is just a plain old normal berm, but she's gorgeous. Her name is Boom Shika or Shika for short. Burmese pythons have a lot of similar pros and cons to boa constrictors, honestly. They are docile. I think they're kind of dumb, like boas are, but I think that's part of what makes them so friendly. And they come in some beautiful color morphs, as you can see here. There's both color and pattern morphs, and you can combine them to get some amazing mutations. Of course, you can expect to pay more for the colorful Burmese pythons than for just the normal wild type ones. And since they aren't super available out there, like compared to ball pythons, or like corn snakes, they do cost a little bit more money than those more common snakes do. You can expect to pay probably around 150 or so for normal wild types, and she was about 300. So just to kind of put that in perspective for you. However, depending on where you live, you might not be allowed to keep these legally. In Florida, where the Burmese pythons are invasive and taking over the Everglades, which is, we have a whole video about that right here if you want to learn why these guys are wrecking havoc uh, on, on the Everglades. Because because of their invasive presence in the Everglades, in Florida there are some restrictions on owning berms. At one point they weren't allowed, you weren't allowed to keep them at all. And I think currently you can't own a Burmese python unless it's microchipped. Correct me comment section if I'm wrong, it keeps changing. But check with your local laws, even your city laws, to see if you can own these. Because sometimes a state will allow a large species of snake, but then your city will not. And that overrules the state policy. So they are big. And and therefore they can have restrictions. Speaking of getting big, they grow to about 14 to 18 feet long on average, some getting over 20 feet long. This is one of our larger Burmese pythons. She's pretty new. I don't think she's been on the channel yet. Her name is Olive Oil and she is one of Popeye, our other albino Burmese python's future girlfriends. But she's not super pretty right now because she's in deep shed. Her eyes are blue. She's got like some dirt on her. She's docile enough, so I'm just gonna film with her anyway. Another similar pro that Burmese pythons have to boa constrictors is that rodents make a complete diet for them. And they'll eat the same type of animals too. So large rats or guinea pigs or even rabbits as long as they're the right size, but they, again, only eat about every three to four weeks as adults, if, if that. But since they get so large, and I know she's gonna get quite a bit bigger too, she's only about seven feet right now, maybe not even, she'll get 
massive as an adult. And we are so excited. We are ready for her to be an adult, especially with some plans that we have for her in the future. But yeah, just like a boa constrictor, if you want a Burmese python, make sure that you have a big enough enclosure for one, along with the funds required to buy all the proper equipment. Everything is just a larger scale when it comes to larger species of snakes, and therefore it costs a little bit more money. So really just their large size or space requirements and the various laws that can prohibit owning of these that are really their only downsides. Something else to consider before we wrap up this video is that with these large species of snakes like Burmese pythons, if you are dealing with a large animal, like a, an, an individual that's like say 12 feet long, it's safest to make sure just in case, since they are still wild animals, that there are two people present just to be on the safe side. I mean, they're not gonna try to kill you because humans are too big for them to eat, but sometimes they just don't know their own strength and them just kind of hanging on to you or wrapping around your body, they'll subconsciously, you know, squeeze uh, an artery a little bit more than they should and things can happen. That's the rule that Ed and I go by whenever one of us handles or feeds or changes water for one of our larger snakes like this, we make sure that the other one of us is also present just to be safe. But that completes our top five intermediate snakes for today's video. So let us know in the comments below which one is your favorite out of today's five. The hognose snake, African egg eater, woma python, boa constrictor, or Burmese python. Let me know in the comments below. Thank you to all of the Patreon backers of this channel. We love you guys, you are amazing, and we love everyone who is just watching our videos. So thank you again, everybody. I hope you enjoyed today's video, and we'll see you next time. Ugh, she's getting heavy. I'm gonna put her back. Chicken quail eggs. Should we take those out? Chicken quail eggs. Or chicken quail eggs. Yeah, yeah, chicken quail eggs. And they'll just eat appropriately SARS. There. What? What's Jeff's song? When a man loves a woman. That's his song. Yeah, that's it.